Amen. All right, here we're in Genesis chapter number four. We concluded Genesis chapter number three, of course, last week, which was the record of the fall of mankind. It ended, the chapter ended with God sending forth mankind, sending forth Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, from paradise. We're going to begin reading in Genesis chapter four, verse one. The Bible says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived, and there came. And said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. There when the Bible says, and Adam knew Eve his wife. You know, because the Bible is a pure book. Because the words of the Lord are pure and perfect. God uses euphemisms. God does not, you know, speak graphically or, or too explicitly to where he would put thoughts into your mind that would be inappropriate. There's nothing in the Word of God that would bring something to mind that would be wrong or inappropriate or anything like that. So that is a, another great plus to the King James Bible. You know, the word S-E-X, I know that they implement that word in some of the new modern Bible versions. You know, words that are just inappropriate, that, that do not, you know, belong in the Bible. They're not God's Word. You know, that's one of the great things about the Bible, you can give it to a, to a young child and he can read it at any age. There's no age you know, when a child is, a, it, it, when it's appropriate for a child to read the Bible. So right there it says, and Adam knew his wife, so they had relations of course, and it, and it explains that to you just in case you were wondering what that means. It says, and she conceived, and bear came and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. So that was the first child that was ever born into this world, was Cain, the oldest son of Adam and Eve. Verse 2, and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And we saw it at the end of uh, verse, I, I believe it was verse 22, when God sends forth no, it's not verse 20. Oh, it's verse 23. I'm sorry. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So we see that Adam began tilling the ground. We saw that was actually when it begins first raining. Adam begins tilling the ground. And we can see now that, that uh, Cain is doing the same thing as well. Verse 3. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. So he brought forth some sort of uh, produce, whether it be vegetables, fruit, whatever it may be. The word fruit is just uh, speaking of the product of something. It doesn't necessarily have to be what we would consider fruit, like grapes, blueberries, oranges, things along those lines. So he brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. That's what he was going to offer. Verse 4, and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat Thereof, And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Verse 5, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So they bring their offering. You see here that, that Cain is a tiller of the ground. That's what he does for a living. You know, he, that's what he, he works with agriculture in the sense that, you know, he's growing corn, whatever it may be. And then he gets this produce, and God has an offering that needs to be offered, that he requests to be offered, of course. And that's what Cain chooses to bring, is the work that he had done, the work that he had brought forth. He had to till that ground. He had to maintain those crops or whatever he, had, he brought forth, right? But then we have here Abel, who is a keeper of sheep. He just follows these sheep around. There's, there's almost no work involved. There really is no work involved. You just follow them around, right? You just look over them. So he's just following these sheep around, and the offering that he decides to bring is going to be one of the flock, one of his flock, from his flock, right? One from his flock. Go to Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 4. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 4 shines a little light on this. It, like I mentioned last week, the New Testament is always our commentary on the Old Testament. The New Testament gives you more details and is much more clear in most cases than the Old Testament. And it, and it is provided in a lot of cases as a commentary. Where you'll learn things in the New Testament that you couldn't have learned from the Old Testament. Once you look at Hebrews chapter number 11, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice then Cain. And then it says this, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, 
God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. I want you to notice that his righteousness is coming from his faith, just like it always does. It says here, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. And then it says, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead yet speaking. I want to point out a second thing in this verse. It's this. If, if uh, you know, Abel bringing the offering by faith was what pleased God, what do you think displeased God about Cain's offering? What would you say? It wasn't by faith. It wasn't by faith. I want you to go back. Go back to Genesis. Again, chapter number four. We're going to look at another verse here in just a moment. But I want to read a little bit more there, the next verse as well. But it wasn't by faith. There's, there's also another layer to this as well. If you notice there, in, uh, in verse number, I want, you to, I want to read verse number six also. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? Wroth means angry. It's just like wrath, right? It's past tense of that. And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. I mean, that's, see how just simple God speaks, how simple it is to understand. If you do well, you'll be accepted. But if you don't do well, you won't be accepted. If you, I mean, it's just so basic, no one can misunderstand that, right? Well, I want you to flip over to Genesis chapter number 3. I want to compare something, a point that I made last week. You may, have, you may have connected these two together, or you may not. But remember how I explained that Adam and Eve, they made their own covering. They sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves, correct? Now, they were. I, I, I have no reason to believe that they weren't properly covered. I believe that they could simply sew fig leaves together and cover themselves as far as covering their nakedness. That's a simple job. So they cover themselves, but even though they were covered... God replaces what they made with what? With an offering that he slays and he kills himself. He provides the offering. And what is it? And what is it? It's some sort of, you know, animal. We don't know specifics, but I'm 99% positive based upon the entire Bible's witness that it was a lamb. It's always a lamb. God always promised to provide a lamb. And ultimately, what did he provide? The Lord Jesus Christ, which was the lamb of God. You know, who came to take away the sins of the world. So when you look here in Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 7, we have them sewing their fig leaves together. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, I want to point out something else with this as well. What is an apron? Is it just something that covers here? No, I don't just believe that, you're, that below the waist is nakedness. An, ap an apron also covers your chest. And what's the purpose that they sewed these together? To cover their nakedness. So what are they doing? Are they just covering below the waist? No, they're covering above the waist as well because that's also nakedness. Above the, above the waist, the chest area, and below the waist also. That's what an apron is because they're covering their nakedness. An apron goes above the, above the waist. It also covers the chest. But they made these. It represents their own works. It represents fruit, right, that they brought forth. They had to go cut it. They had to go make it. God says it's not good enough. That's what you provided. I'm going to provide it. What was it? It was a lamb. That's what it always is. Look at verse number 21 where that happens. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So God clothes them. Then we flip over one page. And what do we see? God again rejecting. God again saying that's not good enough. The fruit of the ground. And what does it represent? Cain's works. Cain's works. The work that he does. What does Abel do? He just brings the sheep. He doesn't work for it. He doesn't do anything for it. Just like salvation. That's exactly what Cain and Abel pictured. And that's exactly what Adam and Eve pictured. You know, when you try to work for it, it's not good enough. God will not receive it. But when you just rely on the lamb, you just, you know, bring the lamb. That's all that you need. Just the lamb. Just plead the lamb. That's it. That's good enough, and God will receive it. Amen. And what was the problem with Cain? He didn't have faith. He didn't have faith. His faith wasn't in God, obviously, because that was what pleased God about Abel. And it tells you that he was not pleased with Cain's offering. I believe it makes perfect sense 
that God must have told them to bring an offering. God was waiting for the offering, and the Bible says, you know, by, uh, by faith, I'm sorry, uh, what is the word, uh, Romans 10, 17? Faith cometh by hearing. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So, in order for Abel to have had faith, he must have first been told something to put his faith in. So God told them, you know, to bring an offering, and God must have told them what type of offering he wanted, and Cain decided to trust in his own works anyways. He thought that his own works were good enough, so he went out there and, 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 and prepared something that God rejected. It's not good enough. And that's exactly, if you try to work for your own salvation, God will reject it. You can be as good as you possibly can be, and it's not good enough. You can live the most, there's a, there is, I don't know who it is, there's no way to tell this, but there's a person, you know, that, that has lived that if you could, you know, uh, you know uh, rank everyone's works, there is someone at the top who lived the most righteous life of anyone that's ever lived. I don't know who it is. Maybe you could find that out from the Bible. But there's someone at the top that lived a more righteous life than anybody else, right? They weren't good enough to get into heaven. Not even close. Right. No one is. You know, they would have been just like Cain if they stood before God at the judgment day and said, hey, please let me in. Not good enough. Right. You have to have the lamb. Amen. It has to be the lamb of God. And that's what we see here. Once you look at verse number 7, I'm going to tell you my interpretation now that I looked at this more. Verse number 7, I referenced this last week. There's a similar statement here in chapter 4. It's also made in chapter 3. It says, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And then he says this, And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, when... When someone is writing, you know, you have to stick to grammatical rules as far as antecedents, right? We've talked about what an antecedent is. It is the word that comes before a pronoun when you decide to use a pronoun, right? The, you know, there has to be an antecedent. You can't just begin a letter by saying he did this and he did that. You have to first introduce the character, which would be the antecedent, which would be a noun. You could say, Tyler went to the store... He bought milk, right? Tyler's the antecedent. He is the pronoun. A pronoun is used in place of an antecedent. But when someone's speaking to someone, that doesn't apply. When someone, when a story is recorded, something that's not written down like that, if a story is recorded, you know, that doesn't apply necessarily, especially if two people are standing before me, right? I would have to make sure that I use an antecedent if I'm speaking to two people that are actually present there. You understand what I'm saying? In that case, I wouldn't need to. I could just say you, thou, thee. You understand what I'm saying? Because I'm speaking directly to you. So I'll tell you my interpretation of verse number 7. There, at the end when the Bible says, And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. I believe that he is obviously... Referencing, he's obviously. Let me say. Let me start by saying this as well. He's obviously speaking to Cain and Abel, right? Those are the, the two people that are mentioned that are before him. Okay, and if Cain is the one that's not doing well, wouldn't it make sense that Abel would be the one that's ruling over Cain? Wouldn't that make sense? Let me say this also. Um, Abel is in that line, genealogy, the genealogical line of the Messiah. Is he not? He is. Okay? Uh, what, actually, is it Abel or is it Seth? It may actually be Seth. I think it's Seth, actually. Huh? He did? Yeah, because he died. You're right, it's Seth. But let me say this still. The point still applies. I was thinking about this earlier. The point still applies because the promise that's given oftentimes about the Messiah, you know, and this applies to anyone that's saved because Abel was obviously saved, therefore he took part in the promise that was given to the seed. So it would still apply to him technically. But uh, the promise that's given, it always, they always uh, talks about, God always talks about when he talks about the, the promise of the Messiah, that the person that's being blessed, that they will own or they will have the gates of their enemies or that they will rule over. I'm going to have you turn to a passage. I'll show you this real quick. Go to Genesis. Go to Genesis. Go to chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Verse number 17. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And he says, And thy seed shall possess the gate 
of his enemies. So what does it say? They're going to rule over their enemies, right? And what is, what is God saying here that one person is going to rule over the other? Well, he's speaking unto two people. I mean, there's only four people on the planet. You understand what I'm saying? So he's speaking unto two people and he's saying, if you sin and don't do well, and then he, he's, and then he goes on to explain and he uses the pronouns and you choose who they apply to, he says, and unto thee shall be his desire and thou shalt rule over him. I believe when he says this, let, let's start the verse over real quick and then I'll, I'll explain. Let's say that Josh is Cain and Brother Russell, you get to be able. No fighting in a moment either. Don't slay, don't rise up and slay him, Josh. It says in verse number seven again, if thou doest well, sin lieth at the door. So I'm speaking to Cain, which is Josh. If thou doest well, uh, if thou, I'm sorry, if thou doest well, shalt thou, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And then I would say this, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? You have to make the thee and thou apply somewhere. There's only four people on the planet, and there's only two people standing in front of him that he says thou and thee. Do you understand what I'm saying? So wouldn't it make the most sense? It's almost that the only option, unless you made sin be a thee or thou, which I don't think that that's an option. So really the only plausible option when he says, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him, is that Cain is going to be ruled over by Abel. Because Cain isn't doing well. He's being ruled over by Abel because, you know, he's being blessed by God. Because that is the blessing, Right? You know, that is a part of the blessing that we saw in Genesis chapter number 22. When that blessing is given of the, of, you know, and really it's just a blessing, let's make it simple. It's a blessing of God to the saved, isn't it? That's what it is. Was Cain saved? He was not. Was Abel saved? He was. We know that from Hebrews chapter number 11. So when you kind of eliminate your options and you create the scenario in your mind, there really isn't a lot of choices, is there? I mean, you really only have one choice that makes sense. So that's why I believe that this saying that he's going to be ruled over because, you know, he's going to possess the gates of his enemy, you know, in that case. And, you know, uh, Cain would be Abel's enemy. And in this case, because he's sinning, he's not doing well. God's blessing Abel. He's giving him a blessing. Therefore, you know, Cain would be ruled over because God is blessing him. That makes sense to everybody? Yeah. It's kind of a confusing little passage right there who it's talking about. It's confusing, but I think when you look at it, you really like strip it down bare. There's not a lot of options when you really analyze the scripture. <clears throat> and this makes sense. And this also uh, is further proof of that. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Now, doesn't that make more sense? After he just got done telling him, if you're not going to do well, I reject your offering. And if you're not going to do well, he's going to rule over you. Wouldn't that make even more sense? You know, it's not just that God wasn't pleased with his offering. He's telling him, like, he's going to be your boss. He's going to, I'm going to bless him, and he's going to possess your gates. I'm going to bless him, and he's going to be ruling over you. So after that, we see that, that Cain is obviously envious of Abel, that God accepted his offering. So he rises up, and he kills Abel, it's funny because I was at work today and a couple of guys that I was working with, this one guy's been asking me questions about the Bible all the time. And he's like, yeah, uh, you know, uh, you know, Cain, he's like, he's like, what's Genesis chapter 4 about? And I was just kind of telling him some stuff. You know, I mentioned Cain and Abel. He's like, yeah, he's like, uh, he's like, that's right, I know about that. He's like, uh, you know, Abel, or he's, he's like, Cain killed Abel and he killed him with a rock. And I was like, well, I don't think it says he killed him with a rock anymore. I'm pretty sure, you know, maybe in the New Testament. But I was like, I, you know, I've looked, you know, in the, in the Old Testament, because I remember actually, uh, I think it was that same uh, thing that I referenced last week, Bible Adventures or something like that, when I watched that Bible Adventures. Has anybody seen that? They always do that, you know, and it's in a lot of other stuff. But in the Bible Adventures, I remember when I watched that, that's what happened, that he killed him with a rock. But you don't really know what happened. And when I was talking to those guys, and I was like, I was like, you don't really know what happened. Maybe, maybe, uh... Maybe um, Cain came and took Abel's staff and smote him with it because he's a, he's a keeper of sheep. The guy was like, that's a pretty cool idea, man. That's a pretty cool idea. But there's, there's multiple options. And I was explaining, I went off of that and explained to him like, hey, that's just someone's opinion. You don't know that. 
So it's important to make sure you don't mix somebody else's opinion. That's the point I wanted to make with this. We don't know how he killed him. Does anybody? Does anyone know where it says anywhere that where he, how he killed him? No, I didn't think so. Maybe I thought maybe the new. I think he's only mentioned one other time. I want to go to that passage. Turn to First John chapter number four. The second half of this chapter is going to go much faster. I wanted to walk through these first verses here. This is a pretty prominent uh, passage. Very profound scripture here in the beginning. First John chapter 4, Cain and Abel are actually mentioned. Uh, Cain by name says in 1 John 4, look at verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. It says, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. Notice he said he's of that wicked one. I'm sorry. What's, oh yeah, I'm in 1 John 3. I thought it was 1 John 4. Yeah, 1 John 3, chapter number 3, verse number 11. So I'll read it one more time so you can look at it. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that you should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. So it tells you specifically right here that he killed him because of his works. You know, it does tell you that. But I want to point something out, too. I made this point not too long ago. This further proves this is another bolstering passage for that. That when it talks about one another, it's not talking about everyone, right? When he says, uh, you know, uh, to love each other or love one another, he's just basically saying love each other, which would be like your brethren, right? Makes perfect sense with this passage when he's telling you to love your brother means love one another because that's the example that's given. If you look at the end of verse 11, he says that we should love one another. Then he says, not as Cain... And then if you look at the end, he says, and his brother's right, and his brother's righteous, right? His brother's works for righteous. So what is he comparing the one another with, and who is he telling you to love? Brothers and sisters in Christ. Not just everyone. You get my point? That's the example that's used, because it's not just love everyone in the whole world. I'm not saying that we shouldn't care for the, uh, you know, the people that are lost and love those that are lost. But that's not what this is teaching, and then it leads into false doctrine that you need to love every single person on the planet, which there's scripture that refutes that. That, that talks about, you know, hating specific people, wicked people, right? So go back to Genesis chapter number 4. So we can see it talks about Cain there, you know, killing his brother. And it gives you insight on the reason why. It's because his, his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. <clears throat> Look at verse number 9. It says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Now that is just an evil response. That is a wicked, evil response, isn't it? When, when God came to Adam, did Adam act like that? Adam was fearful. Adam was afraid when God came to him, wasn't he? He was afraid. He hid himself. But Cain is like, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Is it my job to watch after him? Can you imagine speaking to God like that? That's insane. That's crazy. Am I my brother's keeper? So you can see that Cain, when you really look into the Bible, you read it diligently, you can learn things from just statements that people make. You can tell he's a wicked person. He doesn't care that he killed his brother. And then when God comes to him, he has zero reverence to God. Zero fear of God. Does he? He's not scared even of God. You know, but he, so he says, am I my brother's keeper? Another thing is, is, is the, the, the poetic and the beauty, the poeticness of the Bible and the beauty of the word of God. Am I my brother's keeper? You know, even the world, you know, uses, use, they'll use these types of phrases, won't they? They'll use them for bike, or bike gangs and stuff. You know, uh, I am my brother's keeper, they'll say, right? Uh, so they'll, they'll use these types of things. There's so many phrases that are found in the Bible that uh, from the King James Bible in particular that we use daily, that a lot of people don't even think about. You know what I mean? Like uh, from the book of Job, that you know people will say all the time, like, I escape by the skin of my teeth. Right? You've heard that type of expression? Uh, you ever heard like a little birdie told me? You ever heard that? Anyone ever heard that expression? That's like talking about gossiping. Like a little, They don't want to tell you the person. Well, well, that comes from Ecclesiastes. Everybody know the passage I'm talking about? Don't curse the king unless a, the, a, a, a bird carries the voice to him and then he's angry and wants to kill you or something. I don't know how it ends. But you everybody know what verse I'm talking about? The twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15. Like you could go on and on and on. You know, wandering stars. That comes from Jude. It's talking about, you know, it's not talking about what they're talking about. It's talking about wandering stars. Can anybody think of any just short phrases that we use that comes from the King James Bible? Drop in the bucket. Drop in the bucket, exactly. Yeah. Walk, you know, walk on water. 
Yeah, you walked on water. Yeah, I mean, there's tons of them. You can go on and on and on. Yeah, there's so many. There are just, there are, I, I bet that there are hundreds of just short phrases that we just use constantly throughout the day that derive from the King James Bible in particular. Specifically, not just the Bible, but the King James Bible. You know why? Because it's so beautiful. It's so, just the, the language of it is majestic, it's powerful, so it just creeps into people's language when they use it. You know, and the way that it's written, it's so much easier to, to, uh, to replicate. That's why it's easy to memorize as opposed to these other books. They've done tests and experiments, and the King James Bible is way easier to memorize. You know, it's because this is the Word of God, my friend. That's why. It's a perfect, you know, it's a perfect book. It's the only book that's perfect. Look at what it says next there, verse number 10. And he said, what hast thou done? So, of course, again, this was a rhetorical question. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. I always find that as an interesting statement. Was, was, his voice, was his blood literally crying unto him? I believe what God means is that God is just and he has to do justice. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the blood, have you ever thought of that? The blood's crying unto him because he has to do something about it not literally crying unto him, but God is just. And God, ha when something happens, God has to, you know, he has to make everything right. You understand what I mean? He has to, you know, make, make, uh, make things right. He is a just God. Look at verse 11. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Does everyone know what a fugitive and a, vag a vagabond is? A fugitive is someone that, uh, oftentimes we'll use fugitive like when somebody escapes from jail or something, right? It's someone that's done something wrong and they're running away. A vagabond just means like wonder. Like you'll hear bums call like vagabonds sometimes. Or they're just wonders. They have no certain dwelling place. They have no certain home. They're just... They're just scattered and you know going around everywhere. That's what a vagabond is. A fugitive is basically the same thing, except he's running for, you know, from a punishment. He's, he, he doesn't want to get caught. Now, I want to point out something else, too. If you notice this, that there's the, he, he basically gives the same curse again. Did you notice that? The same curse that he had cursed the ground with. He says, when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto, unto thee her strength. Well, didn't he already do that? Didn't he already curse the ground, right? Well, here's the thing. The nature in general is cursed, but doesn't God bless certain the works of certain people's hands? Doesn't God bless Joseph when he works and it just brings forth fruit, doesn't it? Doesn't God bless the righteous? Doesn't, won't God bless certain people? Well, God can also just curse them further. So he's just saying that when you work, it's going to be even harder to bring forth the fruit that you you know, put efforts into. God could bless, I'm sure, you know, Seth, who ends up being born after this, and then the third child, which replaces Abel. I'm sure, Seth, that God blessed the works of his hands. God blesses the works of the saved. But God right now is putting a curse upon Cain, an extra curse upon the, the land, specifically of the things that he works on. And he's going to have to work that much harder. And God will not only bless the saved, but it'll also curse people, like Ham ends up being cursed, doesn't he? For the rest of his life and all of his descendants, probably in a very similar way. So that's what's going on there. Look at verse number 13. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. So he said, everybody that finds me is going to kill me. He says in verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him <coughs> should kill him. So this is obviously, I believe, a visible mark that they can look at and see. And they know not to do anything to Cain in this circumstance because they can see this mark, so they know, don't touch this guy, Right? It's got to be something that makes them aware or alerts them, I can't, I can't mess with him. Whatever it may be. That's an interesting you know, thought of what this looked like, right? Look at verse number uh, 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. 
And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. People ask the question in verse 17, and atheists try to bring this up. Well, who's his wife? Well, it's his sister. There's no way around it. You know, there's no other way to, 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 to make anything work there. I mean, you only have two people that can procreate at this point. You understand what I'm saying? So it's, it's his sister. And, and this was one of the things that I had talked about, you know, with the, uh, the guy uh, that, at, at, at uh, work that had asked me some questions. He had asked me about that. Where did Adam and Eve's children get their wives? You know, where did the guys get their wives? Their sisters. There's, you know, there's no other option. Obviously, that's the reason why people ask the question, right? Because they want to just say, like, I got you. Or they're just, you know, or they just, it makes them uncomfortable and they just want to, even sometimes when people don't have an answer and they know they're not an answer, they're still, like, having hope that it can be something else. But it's his sister. I mean, that's plainly what it is. There's no other way around it. There's no, pop, there's no one else. Eve is the mother of all living, right? So it was one of his sisters. He married his sister. Now, God later gives commandments that you're not allowed to marry your sister. And, uh, you know, I've heard before, and uh, I've actually read, you know, a couple of different articles about this and scientific studies that, and it makes perfect sense even logically, even without studying the science behind it, that when a person, you know, carries a bad gene, because that's what happens over time is you create these malformed genes, like genetic disorders, right, in your gene code. And then when you have a child, you pass that, you know, uh, a dysfunctional gene down to the next child. So if you have three kids, what do all three of those kids have in common? That specific dysfunctional gene or that malformed gene. You understand what I'm saying? So if those, you know, let's say, uh, you know, a brother and a sister that both possess the same, you know, bad gene, if they have a child, how much more likely are, is that child to have that deformity? Because that's what, when I say malformed gene, the gene actually you know, manifests itself as a deformity, whatever it may be. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, you know, like a, an additional finger or, or di different things like that. Oftentimes when there are, uh, when there are different deformities, they are problems with appendages. I don't know if you've ever thought of that, but that's all, oftentimes what they are. When horses, cows, different things like that, they'll have problems with appendages or they'll have something going on with their head. It's normally one of those two things. But if you have one person that has that bad gene and one person that doesn't, well then you're less likely for the child to have that bad gene, right? But then if two people that have the bad gene, like a brother and a sister, have children, and the bad gene is, you know, six toes, well then you're probably from North Carolina. No, I'm just kidding. But that's why people, no, I'm just kidding. I have to do it every once in a while, right? Yeah, I was looking at Anthony's face waiting you know, to deliver that one, yeah. No, but uh, but that's why people like you know in um, you know in like the mountains that are real secluded and they marry their sister. You know what I mean? That's why they. I'm not saying you guys are from mountains. <laughs> that wasn't at all what I was going after there. But that's why they end up having that bad gene. It's because they they both possess like they they possess. You know, let's say they do have a six toe or whatever it may be. You know, they have they end up having this additional toe, right? Well, that's that's because they had that bad gene. Both of them possessed it. Right? You understand what I'm saying? Then when they, their offspring came, well, they were that much more likely to get that you know that deformity, and then it's passed down to them. So this is my point. The very first, you know, humans did they have all these deformities in the gene code? They did it, didn't they? Because these develop over time. They, uh, scientists, have, I've, I've heard, I've never actually read about this, I've just heard word of mouth, I've never looked at any data on this, but I've heard that they've actually, that they have actually looked at the gene code of a previous uh, generation where the deformity does not exist, and then they'll observe the gene code afterwards, and they have actually seen the deformity uh, created in the gene code, but that's interesting. But I don't know, I've never looked at anything like proof on that, but I've heard that they, that they have done that. And even still, you know, uh, logically it has to come at some point in the first place, right? You understand what I'm saying? They have to be created at one point. First. And, that's, and that's not a proof of evolution at all because people try to use that as a proof. That's, that's the opposite of evolution. That's things getting worse, not getting better. You understand what I'm saying? And it's not added information to the gene code. It's deformed information that was already present from the beginning. Do you get what I'm saying? It's not like it's writing a new code in there and adding it. It's taking the existing information 
and it's and it's you know uh, confusing and, and and making mistakes with the information over time. You understand what I mean? You know, yeah. So so that actually would not be a factor, you know, with, with you know uh, Cain and his sister. So it's the only option, guys. I'm sorry. That's what took place. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. It only gives you the names of uh, of the of the men that were born to Adam and Eve. And she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built in a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begat Mehujael, and Mehujael begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Now we're going to through these last few verses here, but I do want to make a, a statement on this verse. I want to make a point on this is that... We read about people doing things all the time that they shouldn't do. So when you read when you read your Bible and you get into things like this, God never told them to have more than one wife. That, you know, the Bible explicitly says that we're supposed to have one wife. Flip back just one page, Genesis 3, 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Now watch this next part. And they shall be one flesh. You are supposed to. God has appointed that man leaves his father and mother and cleaves unto his wife. And they too, the Bible is quoted in the New Testament saying, they twain and they too shall be one flesh. The Bible repeatedly speaks of, you know, uh, having one child. One, I'm sorry, not one child, one wife. Monogamy. You are to have many children, but one wife, right? You know, only one wife, but many children is what you're supposed to have. Flip over. Children are a blessing. Look at Genesis 4 again. Look at... Read the next verse here, verse number 20. And Ada bare Jabal, he was the father of such as dwell in tents, and, is, and of such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal, he was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. He's saying he killed a man that was trying to kill him. To his wounding, I killed a man to my wounding. And he says, and a young man, so this guy was young obviously, to my hurt. So he was hurting him, he was wounding him, and he killed him. Then he says this, further proof that that is the correct interpretation. It says, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. So he's saying, if, if Cain, when he killed his brother, you know, unrighteously, that if he should be avenged sevenfold, then if I killed myself and I'm just defending myself and I'm innocent, how much more should I be avenged? You know, that's why he says there, uh, Lamech 70 and 7 -fold. So, so much more should I be avenged than him when he unrighteously slew his brother and I was just defending myself. You know, uh, look at uh, verse number 25. And Adam knew his wife again and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel. So in the place of Abel, uh, whom Cain slew. And to Seth... To him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Now I, wanna, I want to focus real quick on uh, calling upon the name of the Lord and what this actually means in this verse when it talks about then began men to call upon the name of the Lord and what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, when you tell someone when you're out soul winning and you show them Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord... You may or may not do this, but I do this myself. If you're with me, I always say, you know, what does it mean to call upon God's name? And then I say this, how do we speak to God? Right? Does anyone else do that? Try to kind of give them a hint of what that means because it's not language that we use all the time. And the person you're speaking to is usually not church. What does it mean to call upon God's name or how do we speak to God? They'll normally just say prayer, right? People understand that. It just means to pray. And that's exactly what this verse is talking about. This is talking about that then began men to communicate with God, to speak to God. Now, calling upon the name of the Lord does not always mean that a person's getting saved when they're doing it. I called upon God's name today a few different times, right? 
when you pray to God. It's what it's saying. I'm going to prove this to you without a shadow of a doubt. That there are people that call upon the name of the Lord when they are not even saved. So that would, that's case closed right there. I'm going to show it to you in just a moment. But it does not always mean, it's not saying that then people started to get saved. No, it's saying that then there was a righteous remnant. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Then now there were men that actually started serving God and speaking to God. It's using that particular phrase by saying that they then began men to call upon the name of the Lord to tell you because of Seth, who ended up being of that line, and Enos, who ended up being taken by God, right, because he was righteous. Does everyone remember that? These men started to worship and serve God and call upon God's name. And oftentimes when people would call upon God's name, what would they do in the Old Testament, especially early on? Does anyone remember? They would offer an offering. Well, that's what we're going to look at right now. I want you to go to Genesis, uh, <clears throat> go to Genesis 15. I know what both these are. Genesis 15 first. This is obviously the famous passage here. This is the salvation of Abraham. I want you to look at Genesis 15. <clears throat> and here in Genesis chapter number 15, you have God preaching the gospel. Isn't that interesting? God preaching the gospel to Abraham. So when we look here, you know, he tells them, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward there in verse 1. Look at verse 2. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house. My house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, You need the word of God to be saved, don't you? This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. And tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. He just received the gospel. He didn't understand all the details, but the Bible tells you in Galatians chapter number 3 that God preached the gospel unto Abraham. That's what it tells you, because who is that seed? Jesus, right? The seed is Jesus Christ, right? So he receives the gospel here, and then it tells you in verse 6, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it. To him for righteousness. What did he count to him? He counted his belief, his faith for righteousness. So was Abraham saved prior to this? He was not. The Bible tells you in Galatians 3 this was his salvation. It talks about this being his salvation throughout the Bible. Not only in Galatians 3, multiple times. It speaks about this being the moment. You have to first hear the gospel in order to be saved, right? Once you go back, I believe it's Genesis 13. Genesis 13. Yeah, yeah, Genesis 13, uh, look at verse 3. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. Now watch this. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. This takes place chronologically before Genesis 15. So what is he doing right now? He's calling on the name of the Lord when he's not even saved. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Calling on the name of the Lord does not mean, oh, that's the moment you get saved. A lot of people may look at this and get confused when they're trying to reconcile chapter 13, chapter number 15, but he's not saved here. He believed the Lord and it was counted on him for righteousness in Genesis 15 when God preached in the gospel. You have to put your faith in the gospel. You have to hear the word of God. Someone has to present unto you. The, you know, the story in some way, God preached the gospel to Abraham, telling him that he was going to bless him, right? And that there was going to be a seed that would come. And he, and he gives him even more details later. And as, as time goes on, there's progressive revelation in the Bible where God gives more and more details over time about how, how Jesus Christ delivers us. But this right here, this promise was about the Messiah coming, and Abraham believed God that the Messiah would come. He believed that there would be a seed of, of himself and that God, you know, there would be a seed that would come from himself and that God would miraculously provide this seed. And, there, and there's all types of pictures with Abraham having, you know, this child with Sarah and Jesus being born of Mary. Her being barren and not able to have children, right? Pictures, the, you know, the virgin birth of Mary not able to have children. But here we see a perfect example of where someone calls on the name of the Lord when they're not even saved. So when we look here in Genesis chapter number 4, 
And it talks about in Genesis chapter number 4, then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. It's not telling you, oh, then, then, then people started getting saved. No, it's just saying, men, then men began to call on the name of the Lord to just pray to God, build altars and worship God. You understand what I'm saying? So when people try to use this about salvation, uh, they'll be hyper-dispensationalists, right? They'll try to use these passage about, this passage about salvation. What you were bringing up the other day, what's one of the arguments that they use when they, when they actually point to this? Do you remember? You brought it up the other day, but I don't remember exactly how they articulate the argument. But they, they try to say that this is salvation in some way. That this is then people getting saved. But that argument is null and void because they misunderstand the passage. Because it's not saying that then, man, then began men to get saved. I don't believe that. Because calling upon the name of the Lord is just talking about praying to God. Abraham's praying to God. David talks about calling upon the name of the Lord. David talks about taking the cup of salvation and calling upon the name of the Lord. He's just talking about being uh, saved physically. He prays to God and God physically delivers him from a fight or something along those lines. Now, I definitely believe that someone needs to ask for salvation. I believe that Romans 10, 13 is speaking about calling upon the name of the Lord and asking God to save them. People do not, oftentimes, they misunderstand calling upon the name of the Lord and they misunderstand repentance. But both of these are the exact same thing. Because repentance is a change of mind. You are not saved just by an intellectual assertion, but by just asserting to certain facts that, yeah, I just believe that Jesus is God, or I believe that it's only by belief. That does not save you. I always explain that to the person that, you know, uh, I give the gospel to. And I explain to them when I get to the very end that you have to ask Jesus to save you. There has to be a moment in which you choose and decide to put all of your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And you know what happens? When you call upon the name of the Lord and ask Him to save you. That's when calling upon the name of the Lord comes in to salvation. That is the moment of repentance. That's when they're changing their mind. They've heard the gospel. Now decide whether you're going to get saved or not. Right. And if they pray to God and ask Him to save them, that is the moment of, of salvation and the moment of repentance. You know, obviously we, we reject the false teaching of repent of your sins. That is not what, tr you know, true repentance is change of mind. Right. You don't need to do this, but even if you look at the, at the, the, the Greek words... It comes from a Greek word that says metanoia. That is metanoia. Meta need, need, uh, means change. Like metamorphosis, right? Do you understand? It's, it's talking about metamorphosis, that word, if you're not familiar with that word, means to change form. The meta, that prefix, means to change. Noia comes from like paranoia, right? That's referring to your mind. Do you ever understand what I'm saying? So you put those two together... Change of mind. Meta means change. Noia means mind. The word repentance means to change your mind. That's what the word repentance actually means. God repents more than anyone else in the Bible. God does not have sin. Therefore, it says that God repented. It's not saying that he turned from sin. It's saying that he changed his mind. Therefore, you know, the word repent does not mean repent of sins. The phrase repent of your sins is never found in the whole Bible. One time. Ever. You know, it's a false doctrine. You do not have to turn from your sins. You should, but you don't have to to be saved. You should, you should turn from your sins, not to be saved, because you love God. That's why you should turn from your sins. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So when it says, then began then to call upon the name of the Lord, I, don't, I believe that now there's like a revival. That's basically what I believe that that verse means. I believe now men began, now, now uh, at, at this point, men began to call upon the name of the Lord because there's a righteous remnant. Enoch, you know, is, is uh, after this, is translated, right? Enoch is, is uh, translated, you know, because he's a righteous man. So that's what I believe that this man means. Uh, Seth uh, ends up being a righteous man. And you looked that up. Wasn't Seth the one that was in the line of the genealogy? It looked like you were looking up. I thought that it was Seth. Once I had said that and it came out of my mouth, I was like, that's not right. Yeah, so Seth is actually the one that's up the line of the Lord Jesus Christ coming from Adam. So we can see that, yeah, so uh, yeah, Genesis chapter number 4, it ends there with, with Seth being born. And then when we pick back up in Genesis chapter number 5, we're going to be reading through some of the genealogies and following the genealogies through. So make sure that you're here for next week. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all the stories, stories we can learn from. Of Cain and Abel, Lord God, uh, help us uh, to apply these stories in our lives. Help us to read your word and just purge as much information as we can from it. 
Dear Lord, help us to be uh, diligent students of the Bible and help us not to be ashamed uh, when we finally see you face to face and that we, we've loved your word and we've also done as much work as we can while we're here. Please bless our church and as I've prayed many times, give us the skills, the resources, and wisdom uh, that we might use that to uh, build the church, dear God, on your behalf. And please be with us and, and uh, help everything that we do to be for you and have the right heart and not a selfish heart. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.